Thank you very much. It is really an honor to be here with you at Grace Covenant Church. And an honor to be with you online as well, those who are not with us physically. I was where you are for most of uh, the last year. My wife and I secretly joined Grace Covenant online. Uh, we would go to our church in Nashville and either watch Grace Covenant before or after. So we were uh, double churching throughout all of it. And I told Pastor Brett, uh, we are new members of Grace Covenant Church. We're non-tithing members. We tithe in our home city. But uh, he said, well, we have a few of those. So welcome to the... <laughs> uh, but we were up to date every week on Grace Loves, on all the great things that God is doing in you, through you, for you, and so it's uh, really great to be with you physically right here. It is so tempting to go around the room and acknowledge all of the wonderful friends and leaders who are here, but I'll say one thing about Grace Covenant. I'll actually probably say more than one, but I have met so many people yesterday, this morning, and my previous trips, but especially this time who have been at Grace Covenant for two decades, three decades, and longer. And I, and I thought about this. Um, we're really, we really care about relationships. We really don't see relationships as disposable. And that there are so many long-term relationships in this church is refreshing and encouraging. Um, if you're new here, I hope you'll be here long enough to have decades-long relationships, lifelong friends uh, that you do spiritual life with. Brett and I go all the way back to 1981. I didn't actually meet him then. Many of you were not yet alive. <laughs> Rice and I were at Mississippi State University, and in spring break of 1981, our little campus fellowship had an outreach at Indiana University during spring break. And a guy that I led to the Lord and was discipling, Randy Young, shared the gospel to Pastor Brett. It wasn't Pastor Brett. He was just a student at IU. And he came to a meeting and met Jesus during that outreach. Now, Brett and I met maybe a year, two years later, and have been doing ministry and doing life together for decades and so that, just get used to that if you're new at Grace Covenant. We kind of stick around for a long time. We kind of stay together, um, and, and, and we're better for that. Um, so there are a lot of people who have those kind of stories here. Um, I had the privilege, and I want to say a moment about you get to experience Grace Covenant here in the Washington, D.C. metro area. I get to experience Grace Covenant all over the United States, with the church planters that you have sent out all over the world. Uh, this man right here, Keith Tower, we've been working together in Every Nation Seminary for several years. And, you, and your people are all over the place. But I also get to experience Grace Covenant globally. You are a charter member, a founding member of Every Nation Churches and Ministries. We're in 80 nations in the world. When Brett stepped into this, right when he heard this whole idea of Every Nation, I mean, within... A week or two of the whole idea started. He said, I want in. I want to reach the world together with Phil and Rice and myself and a few others. And you've been a part of impacting the world. I get to travel. I haven't much in the last year, but typically I get to travel all over the world and I see the fingerprints of Grace Covenant. Um, recently, I was in South Africa. You can put a picture. I, I, I brought, um, I had Pastor Tellus with me in South Africa Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, it all blends together, and I don't know, it, something. And we had, for the first time face-to-face -face in almost a year and a half, we had over 300 leaders from eight nations in East and Southern Africa. And the theme, I was told, was how to build a culture of honor. So I immediately said, do you guys mind if I bring someone with me? So I brought Pastor Tellus with me. And I did it because I knew they would think it was Brett. No. <laughs> they kept looking. <laughs> uh, no. Um, and I, I, it was such a joy. I've, I, I've known him through you guys. 
But spending a week ministering together and carrying the weight of ministry with 300 plus pastors, missionaries, evangelists, campus uh, missionaries, all these people, and ministering, sharing the platform, ministering with him was a privilege. And what he did was talk about you guys. He talked about what he learned from all of your pastors and leaders here and what this church models in honoring God, honoring one another, and honoring every human made in the image of God. And it was so powerful, so, so proud of him. I hope um, you guys get the, the message from that. And also, not only Pastor Tellus, but also, uh, hit the next one, also ministering with me were Tim and Lachelle Johnson. I mean, this is their home church. Uh, when, you know, he was an athlete here in, 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 in your city, and Pastor Brett was the chaplain, and his life was changed. And when his football career ended, he couldn't do anything other than preach. I mean, he could do a lot of things, but he couldn't. God wouldn't let him. And um, he was talented enough, smart enough to do a lot of things. But Brett sent him to Nashville to help Pastor Rice, and, and then he ended up going back to his hometown of Orlando. But ministering with them, Tim has, he's the apostle of hugs and healing. I don't really do either. So he was a designated hugger, but every evening, Tim started with praying for sick, and he had words of knowledge. God would speak. To, it was so powerful watching and seeing so many people touched by the power of God and the healing, and then I'd get out of the way and let Tim hug them all when it was over. But this was after the conference. Tellus went home, came back here, and Tim and Michelle and my wife, Deborah, who's here, and I, and, and our, my lifelong friends, Roger and Nicola Pierce, in the middle seat. They're our Southern Africa regional directors. We went out in the bush to get close to the animals, and that was Lachelle's face the whole week. <laughs> our driver was intentionally going really close to those rhinos and lions just to watch Lachelle react. Uh, I wish I had, actually, we do have videos. There are people with videos of, this, of her reaction. So. But again, this is Grace Covenant. These are Grace Covenant people. They're all over the world. You guys are really, literally changing the world. Well done, Grace Covenant. Um, <clears throat> next slide, I want to introduce you to a few people. Then I'm going to preach a sermon. These are some of our regional leaders in Africa. The guy next to me, I'm the... Um, white guy with no hair. The guy next to me with the ENC shirt, that's Ronnie. Ronnie is the pastor of the newest Every Nation Church, the newest nation we're in. He planted his church in COVID about four months ago. He had 300 people at his opening service, baptized a whole bunch of them in Kampala, Uganda. Ronnie grew up. I hope I hope we can have Ronnie preach here someday. All 110 pounds of him is filled with fire. He's like, he's like the spirit of Chris Johnson in a smaller body. Um, Ronnie was a compassion kid. Anybody familiar with Compassion International? Six kids in his family. His father left the family when he was little. Grew up in dire poverty. But American Christians through Compassion sponsored him. And he was very smart, so he got scholarships through Compassion all the way high school, all the way through college, and met Jesus along the way and started doing campus ministry on his campus. He didn't know what campus ministry was. He just started reaching students. He's an evangelist. He just started winning students. And when he graduated, he had to keep doing it. So he just stayed there and kept reaching students. Had no idea there was a thing called campus ministry, not much less an every nation campus. He just did it. And then a mission team came from every nation London a couple of years ago to Kampala, and they tried to get on campus. They couldn't. And every student they met said, well, if you want to do something religious on campus, you need to find Papa Ronnie. He was only 27 years old at the time. They all called him Papa Ronnie. Every student they met, you got to talk to Ronnie. You got to talk to Ronnie. They go, Who's this Ronnie guy? They meet him. And he was so discouraged, he was about to quit the ministry. And they did an outreach with him. And he got the idea from our Every Nation Church in London. I need one foot on the campus, one foot in the community. I need a church and a campus. He goes, that's what's missing. The church, will you guys help me plant the church? And whatever this every nation thing is, that's what I want to be. So he went and spent, he spent months in Philip Pretorius' home in South Africa. Went back and planted that church, and he was with us at the conference. I, it was just hearing his stories. Next to uh, the other guy, uh, next to Ronnie with the red shirt and the gray jacket. That's Jean-Baptiste. 
He pioneered our, one of our newer churches in Burundi. It's a French-speaking church, and he was a refugee in the Philippines. His dad's a pastor. He took his wife and kids because of the Civil War, so much violence in his nation. He had to get his family out of there. Came to the Philippines and had a job making good money because he was multilingual and doing well. But he made the mistake of going to our church. And the world vision just captured him. And, and after years, he just said, I have to go back to my people. I have to. And he moved his wife and his kids back, pioneered a church uh, on a street called Blood Street. It was right in the center of the Civil War where just thousands were slain. There's still bloodstains on the street and even in the building where our church meets. And these are just two examples of this family that Grace Covenant is a, an original member of, of what we're doing together around the world. And Grace Covenant has been one of the most generous financial contributors to what we do together as every nation in global missions. Uh, there's no church I can think of that's more generous than what you do. So thank you on behalf of the people, these kind of people are reaching all over the world. Thank you from them for what you do, not just Grace Loves locally, but how you extend the gospel in your reach through your generosity and prayers and sending people, all that you do all over the world. All right, back to John J.B. And I'm going to say this. Oh, that's Pastor Roger, our regional director. Anyway, kind of you need to find him. That's where you'll find him, and that's exactly how you'll find him. But let me go back to J.B. He was living a good life in the Philippines as a refugee, but good life. But the Lord spoke to him that he needed to go back. At great sacrifice, he went back. Who do you listen to? JB listened to God's call on his life, and it took him out of comfort into danger. It took him out of prosperity into a life of tremendous sacrifice. It took him out of living in comfort into a place that is not even close to what he left for years. Who do you listen to? We want to talk about that today, who you listen to. Who gets the space between your ears? Because who we listen to and what we allow in our head through our ears eventually affects our heart. And what goes in our heart then begins to impact everything about us, our values, our decisions, both big and small. So who do you listen to? End of January, I wrote a blog, and I specifically stated that I want to give a theological perspective, a biblical perspective, a global perspective, a missiological perspective on January the 6th. Not on it, I wrote it later, but of what happened. And I was writing to give the church in America, the people who listen to my voice at least, a theological perspective, a biblical perspective, a global perspective, and a missiological. What are the missiological implications of this? And so I posted it. And I don't pay attention to comments or responses or any of that, but occasionally my office will say, you probably should see this. And so they did that quite often for the next week. <laughs> and um, it was interesting, the responses, because some of the responses, people were saying, you need to stop listening to CNN so much. I don't listen to CNN at all. There were other comments that said, you need to stop listening to Fox News so much. I don't listen to Fox News. So I successfully offended both ends, apparently. <laughs> but my goal was to give a biblical, theological, missiological, global perspective on something that happened here. And that's not what I'm talking about. I want to talk about who you listen to. I could tell by the responses whether they listen primarily to Tucker or Anderson. It was obvious who occupied the space between their ears. But I hope we listen to something way more authoritarian and way more important voices than what the culture listens to. 
The people we're about to read, I want you to turn to Luke 9. Luke 9. The people in this story we're going to read were Jewish people 2,000 years ago. And Jewish people listen to two places. If you ask any of those Jewish people, what voices do they listen to? Here's the answer. The law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. You would hear Jesus mention the law and the prophets. You would hear Paul reference the law and the prophets. You would hear the Old Testament writers reference the law and the prophets. And so in Jewish culture, Jewish culture, Jewish values... Uh, Jewish religious uh, traditions and worship practices and even what they ate and the clothes they wore, it was all built upon what the law and the prophets said. The law, the Pentateuch, the, the Torah, the first five books uh, the, the, attributed to Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, that's the, the law. The prophets basically was all the rest of the Old Testament. Now, some people would narrow it down and say only those that had the name of a prophet on them. But really, for most people, it was the prophets was the rest of the Old Testament. The law were the first five books. So that's what all of culture, society, values, relationships, how you do family, what you do with money, everything you do, that's who you listen to. The law and the prophets. So watch what Jesus does in this text. These are the people in the story, listen to the law and the prophets. They build their lives on that. Luke chapter 9, verse 18, 19, and 20. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah and that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. The Christ of God. Now, interesting context of this in verse 18. This is a strange statement. It says, Jesus was praying alone and the disciples were with him. Wait a minute. Was he alone or were people with him? He was alone and some people were with him. And I thought when I read that, it was, a, it was one of those puzzling things. And I, my, result, my prayer result in my journal on that point was, Lord, I don't want you to be alone when I'm acting like I'm with you. You ever been, you know, you're supposed to be, you're with Jesus, but he's really alone because you're not dialed in. You ever been with your husband or wife, but they're actually alone, but you're actually with them. There's this thing of being present, but then really being present. Jesus is praying alone. The idea was they're supposed to be there with him, but he ended up alone, but they were there just taking up space. Let's not be those people. So he asked them, and he asked them. This is a corporate question. He asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And I don't have to tell you this, but you know this. The crowd is almost always wrong when it comes to Jesus. The crowd is almost always wrong when it comes to just about anything. The crowd is always fluid in their opinions about Jesus or about a lot of things. And so the answer, these are people who always listen to the law and the prophet, and their answer was basically the law and the prophet. So who do the crowd say that I am? They say, well, you know, some say John the Baptist he was a preacher of the law. Some say one of the prophets, Elijah, etc. The law and the prophet. That's kind of their answer. That's really their grid that they think through. Um, so then he says, well, who do you say that I am? And it's important to see on this point when he says, who do you say that I am? It's not an individual you. You in the English language is either plural or it's singular depending on the context. The context here, Jesus is speaking to 12 people. He's looking at 12 people and saying, who do you say? Because listen, who I individually say Jesus is, is completely irrelevant. There is no my truth or your truth. He said, who do you, this community of believers, this, this, this spiritual community, who do you corporately say that I am? We have such an individualistic breakdown of everything in life in the West that we miss what's being said here. He's not asking an individual. Peter did respond speaking for the group, but he asked the group. Spiritual life is always done best in community. And that's what's modeled in scripture. Not a bunch of individuals following Jesus, but following in community. 
Who do you say? Who do you guys? Or the literal Greek is y'all. <laughs> Who do y'all say I am? It's a plural. It's a collective. And so it's the right answer. Peter answered that you're, you're the Christ. Christ was the Greek. The Hebrew is Messiah. It's the same word, Christ or Messiah. Exactly the same thing. It's just two different languages. You're the Christ. And right answer. But do you know you can get the right answer about Jesus and have the wrong spirit? You know you can get the right answer about lots of things in the Bible and totally misapply it? I know that from experience. I've, done, I've made a life of doing that. I hate to look back and go through all the times I had the right answer in the wrong spirit. I had the right answer in the wrong interpretation. I had the right answer, and yet I didn't model it whatsoever in any way, but I was still trying to evangelize. Maybe it's not just me. Maybe it's some of us as well. They had the right answer, but their interpretation was so wrong. Because these are people who grew up, everything about their belief system was the law and the prophets. And what they had inherited was one day this Messiah is coming. This Christ, this Messiah. And they look forward to this. And they live for this. This Christ, the Messiah is coming. But they interpreted it politically. They thought the Messiah would come and get rid of the political structures that brought oppression to the Jewish people. The Roman political structure would be gone. That's what they thought Messiah would do. They interpreted it ethnically. They thought that he's the Messiah for us, Jewish people, not for all the Greeks and not the other people and the, from all the other cultures. For us, they interpreted it through their own political ideas, ethnicity, and they interpreted it nationalistically. Our nation. Remember in Acts 1.8, when they ask the question, are you at this time going to restore our nation? Jesus goes, no, no, that's not what I'm about. No, 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 no. This is about power to be a witness to lost people. And there's just a whole history of Christians interpreting Jesus politically, ethnically, and nationalistically. And we usually come to the wrong conclusions when we have that filter on. We might every now and then accidentally stumble on truth. But usually we're wrong. They had the right answer. You're the Christ. But then their version of what the Christ, the Messiah was, was so messed up. So Jesus starts correcting it. Watch what happens. Next verse, Jesus corrects it. Verse 21. He goes, let me, let me, let me upgrade your doctrine of the Messiah. So he says, um, oh, verse 23. Oh, so yeah, 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and then raised from the dead. So he goes, okay, listen, Messiah is going to be suffering, rejection, persecution, and death. No, no, wait a minute, Jesus, that's not Messiah. That's what Messiah does to the Romans. No, 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 that's what the Romans are going to do to the Messiah. It, I'm, can you understand how confused they were at this point? Wait, that's not what we got from the law and the prophets, or at least how we thought they taught. And then he goes now, and he not only corrects their idea, their doctrine of Messiah, and he lets them know that suffering is a part of this life, but then he starts correcting their view of discipleship and what it means to follow him. Verse 23, he said to, to all of them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. He's going, it's not just Messiah is going to suffer. You are too. It's you too. You want to be a part of this, there's a price to pay. We live in a culture, maybe it was there too. We live in a culture today of self-fulfillment, of self-promotion, of self-absorption. And Jesus calls very people like that to self-denial. Deny self that's the kingdom lifestyle, not pamper self. My wife showed me a disturbing hashtag that she saw either on, I don't know, one of the social medias, and it was by a Christian author. And the hashtag was, I choose me. Huh. That's a real interesting message for the Christian community, isn't it? For 2021, I choose me. Why don't you choose him? Deny you, 
and choose him. Jesus says, who's the crowd say? You know, there are a lot of different sources of information and truth. The crowd, what does the crowd say? Well, they said this, well, that was wrong. What do you say? What does the spiritual community say? Okay, that was right answer. And then he goes in, brings some corrections, brings some adjustments. Then we get the transfiguration. These stories are put together on purpose in the Bible. And so following this dialogue of these Jewish people who are talking to Jesus, now what happens, Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Scripture does not tell us which mountain. Almost every time a mountain's mentioned in the Bible, it's labeled what the mountain is. This one is not. Although I've had tour guides in Israel take me to the very mountain. <laughs> Depending on which tour group you get, it's various mountains. There's a lot of them. Um, you can buy a keychain that proves that you've been there. But it doesn't tell us what mountain this is. They go on the mountain. Jesus picks Peter, James, and John. And transfigured is a weird word in scripture. The only way I can even describe it is that he was glowing. Kind of like Moses when he came off the mountain with the Ten Commandments after face to face with God. And Jesus is transfigured before them, whatever in the world that means. And they react by being afraid. Pretty good response. They saw his glory. And then two people appear. Two other people show up. Jesus goes up. With Peter, James, John, Jesus, he starts glowing in the presence of God. And then suddenly two people appear and they look and they realize, I don't know how they knew it, but they realize it's Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah are here dialoguing with Jesus. I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments. Some people are really into gawking at celebrities. Some people are, some people aren't. Some people do it privately, but... I don't really usually do that because I'm overseas a lot. And when I meet celebrities, I don't know they're celebrities. So I meet these, uh, in Nigeria, there were these people that were celebrities. I didn't know it until I was explained later. In the Philippines, I'm constantly meeting people like that. And I don't know who they are. So I treat them all the same, which is a good thing. But I did have a moment where I was, I was, became a fan. I was, I was celebrity stars. And it was in Australia about 10 years ago, and I was a speaker at a conference. There's a whole bunch of pastors, a nationwide conference, and I accepted the invitation. And about a week later, I found out who the other speaker was. And I immediately called my buddy who was doing the conference. I said, would you please give my slots to him? I don't think anybody wants to hear me. They're all coming to hear him. It was Reinhard Bonnke. Some of you know who that is. I mean, Reinhard Bonnke is the guy who took the gospel from Cape Town to Cairo and had like multiple millions of people saved and countless miracles. And, and he rides the same motorcycle I ride. <laughs> I felt so good about my choices at that moment. Of course, he is German. And when I met Reinhard Bonnke, I was just like, do I get a selfie? Do I get an autograph? Do I drop to my knees? Do I get him to lay hand? What do I do? But he was so gracious and he was so normal and he was so human and he was so humble. But I was, I was just, I'm sure he thought, who is that weird guy? <laughs> but this guy was a legend, a hero. I, I can imagine Peter, James, and John. Their whole lives they've grown up with these legends. And here they show up. Who shows up? Moses and Elijah. The law and the prophets. Moses, who wrote the law. And the prophet who, the miracle working prophet that was like the, high, the top of the prophet totem pole. And they're face to face. Their whole life has been shaped by the law and the prophet. Every tradition they've had, everything they believe, everything they value, the way they do family, the way they do worship, the way they eat, the way they dress, the way they do their hair. Everything has been built on what they listen to from the law and the prophets. And then what happens in this moment? A voice from heaven. In verse 35. The voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Wait a minute. I've grown up my whole life listening to these guys. I have built my whole identity, my whole life, my whole belief system, everything about me is rooted in these two voices, the law and the prophet. Not just those individuals, but what they represent. And now God's saying, this is my son. Listen to him. Some of us have been listening to traditions and cultures and voices. They're not bad voices. 
They're not. Nobody would say Moses and Elijah were bad voices. But there comes a time when we have to stop listening to certain things we've always listened to. And listen to him. There are times when he will tell us things that every voice we've ever listened to is saying the opposite. That was JB leaving the Philippines and going back to a war-torn nation. Everybody in his life is like, don't do this. You left that. You have a good life. No, but he was listening to him. Who are you listening to? Who are you giving prime time, that space between your ears? Who are you giving that to? We can't take the time, and I won't do it, to go through all the times I listened to him and how it turned out and the times I shut that voice out and regretted it. Listen to him. Listen to him. I don't know who has your ears, but listen to him. Listen to Jesus. The starting point of that is getting up every day, opening that Bible up, and listening to his words. It's also pausing after you listen to this and seeing what the Holy Spirit wants to say about that. We had a pause moment during communion to listen to him. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that as a people, as a church family, as individuals, as families, we would listen to you like never before. And Lord, if you want to say something that contradicts everything that we've, every direction we've been going and everything that we've thought was the best thing to do and you say something else, Lord, we want to listen to you. We want to hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Can we thank Pastor Steve? If you've been somebody who's been hearing a lot about Jesus, but not listening to Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to now follow Jesus. When we hear a message like that, we can see and hear the good news about this person of Jesus, this Messiah is Christ. And if you're not fully confident that you are his and that he is yours, or maybe you've never made that decision before in your life, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. If you would pray with me for a moment, Lord, right now I'm just asking that you would touch hearts, God, that you would awaken hearts to the truth of the gospel. God, that they have a good shepherd. It says in John Chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If you're somebody who wants that eternal life from the good shepherd, I just want you to raise your hand right now so I can pray with you. If you're in this room and you're not sure if you're his, you're not sure if you're following him, I wanna give you that opportunity that moment where you can say, I have eternal life because of what Jesus did for me. Amen. Amen. And if you're online, you can click that button. I raise my hand. You can even raise your hand physically. Praise God. If that's you in this room and you made that decision, I just want you to pray this with me in your heart. Say, Father, I choose to say no to all the voices that I have been listening to. And I choose to say yes to listen to your voice. God, I choose to turn away from sin and to follow Jesus. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and that he was raised on the third day. And I choose to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Holy Spirit, I invite you in, change me, empower me, counsel me, help me to follow Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen.
Can we give it up for those people who just gave their lives to Jesus? Amen. 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 If you did just give your life to Jesus, we encourage you to scan. There's a QR code that's going to be behind me. We use that QR code for everything, baby. And what you can do is you can scan that QR code and you can get connected to us. Just say, I just gave my life to Jesus. Or you can email info at gracecove.org. We have a Discover Discipleship class that we plan every single week just for people like you, just for people who want to know what it looks like to really follow Jesus. So if you just made that decision, we encourage you email info at gracecove.org to get on that class today via Zoom.